Hello, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, this is uh, the 2nd of March and uh, welcome to the event on the Arab winter and uh, the democracy and discontent by Dr. Stephen King, hosted by the uh, SOAS Middle East Institute and co-chaired by myself, uh, the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies and uh, Nargis Perzad, who is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. My name is Dina Matar. I am uh, in the Center for Global Media and Communication at SOAS and the chair of uh, CPS. Um, Dr. Stephen King is going to talk about a very interesting topic, particularly now that we are uh, in the 10th anniversary of the Arab uprisings. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'm just going to give you a brief uh, uh, bio. He is Associate Professor of Government at uh, Georgetown University in the US. He is the author of several books. Uh, the first is Liberalization Against Democracy, and then the new authoritarianism in uh, the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region. And he is the co-editor of the Lure of Authoritarianism. And he is also the author of the book that he is going to talk about, which is uh, The Arab Winter, which was published in 2020. I just don't know how he has time to, uh, to write all these books, but uh, we're looking forward to hear uh, from you um, Dr. King is going to speak, and uh, I will collect questions in the question and answer um, button that you see at the bottom of the museum Zoom uh, page. And um, for those people who are joining us um, by Facebook, welcome. And you will also post your questions in the uh, chat box on the side. So, uh, Dr. King, the floor is yours, as we say, or the platform, or uh, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. So, like many scholars of the Arab world, I was working on authoritarian resilience just prior to the Arab Spring. And if you look at that scholarship, um, um, certainly nearly everyone saw the authoritarian Arab republics that were the main participants in the Arab Spring as dystopian. We, we uh, acknowledged many um, um, issues that um, Arabs felt that needed improvement and we did not, whatever angle uh, one had about explaining this authoritarian resilience, um, what the literature did do is, is demonstrate the uh, difficulties and challenges and frustrations in the Arab world just prior to the Arab Spring. That said, I was as surprised as anyone when as Faris Mubarak, the director, when as Faris Mubarak, uh, the director of Arab Policy Institute said aptly, the Arab world has decided to reinvent itself. This decision did not come from the top. It was claimed by each and every one of us from the most famous to the anonymous. And we, we Everyone here probably recalls the excitement of the early Arab Spring, how you had the mass uprisings, uh, you, the shocking uh, uh, removal from power of, of Ben Ali in Tunisia, Mubarak in, in Egypt, and eventually Salah in Yemen, and Gaddafi being killed uh, in Libya. And we hadn't seen anything like that, it was out of the blue to an extent. Um, and you had, um, after, the, after authoritarian breakdown in those countries, you had serious elections that led to transitions in power. Who would have thought the Nahada and the Muslim Brotherhood would win competitive elections and actually take power? Um, getting rid of Salah with the help of the Gulf Cooperation Council and the election of, he ran unimposed, unopposed, I guess, Hadi in the election of Hadi. Um, and there they had an exciting national dialogue conference in Yemen that, that sought to do what I tried to, to do here in this book. They, they had committees trying to deal with nation building and state building. They had committees dealing with, um, efforts to strike a 
democratic political bargain trends, all of the issues that I'll talk about in this study. They organized a national conference in Yemen to deal with them. Um, that was exciting as well. Uh, Libya, uh, we have to recall that uh, just after Gaddafi uh, was killed, there was a serious uh, election in which it was a July, I think of that year, uh, in which um, a coalition of largely secularists won in those elections. Uh, so that's another transfer in power. Um, Tunisia, Yemen, Libya, Egypt, Mubarak, I've talked about that. And of course, Tunisia getting rid of Bin Ali. Okay, so the, the, the breakdown happened and there were democratic tra transitions in those places. I define democratic transitions in terms of competitive elections in, when, in which the opposition actually wins and takes power. So these were serious uh, elections and, and um, obviously there are uprisings in Syria that, that uh, ended up in, in the nightmare that we have. Uh, Bahrain nearly fell, the rulers there. Um, without the help of, of Saudi Arabia, and they might not have uh, succeeded. Egypt looked promising at the beginning, and, and they certainly had competitive elections. Um, surprisingly, the military allowed Morsi to take power. Uh, obviously, at the end, the, the uh, democratic consolidation was not achieved and, and obviously Morsi has reimposed the military authoritarian regimes. But I often think that if Libya, I mean, I'm sorry, if Egypt uh, had consolidated its democracy, um, then the, the, there would have been a different tenor to the whole Arab Spring because of the number of Egyptians in terms of the population in the region. Um, so I took, uh, it, caught up in the excitement and hope for the region. Uh, this was a, rebe a rebellion from below that sought democracy, respect for human rights, socioeconomic justice, and the end of, to corruption. All would have improved uh, the lives of people in the region so much. Um, so it's exciting to see the possibilities, but also as an analyst, I had to think about um, um, what would what will be the outcome or what was the outcome? And so when I was developing the framework for this, um, I, um, I ended up focusing on democratic consolidation. And I used the uh, comparative research I used the comparative research to um, define democratic consolidation and to try to figure out how it would operate in progress. And there were a couple of, uh, in the literature, there were a couple of uh, broad approaches to democratic consolidation. One talked about emphasize the elections and changing values and attitudes. A second approach uh, was, it, uh, was an, uh, an aggregate approach, which looked at disaggregating the areas that um, pose the biggest challenge to democratic consolidation. And so I um, landed on the uh, democratic transitions literature, which is a disaggregate approach. And um, this transitions literature was one of the leading anyway, approaches to democratic transitions. And I'm talking here uh, uh, about Schmitter and O'Donnell. And um, one part of, let me talk about the part of that framework uh, that didn't fit at all. Uh, if we recall in the literature at the time, in the literature on democratic transitions, uh, including uh, the approach by uh, O'Donnell and Schmitter, uh, 
really emphasize uh, conflicts within authoritarian regimes. That uh, would lead to an opening in which the people would rise up. But the start came from within the regime. That didn't uh, fit their spring at all. It was an uprising from below, a mass uprising. Bin Ali's regime wasn't splitting or seemingly in danger uh, prior to their spring. So that said something about the general literature and what authoritarian breakdown looked like in the Arab world. Um, so we saw in the Arab world mass uprisings were important. We saw that social media turned out to be important. We saw that the role of a martyr turned out to be important with Mohammed Bouazizi and the copycat martyrs during the Arab Spring around the region that uh, a martyr seemed to uh, create solidarity with, with the masses and help to overcome um, collective action issues. People were out in the street en masse and certainly the martyrdom of Boisizi contributed to that and, and how people felt solidarity to his experience. As we recall, he was the young poor man, Mohammed Boisizi in Tunisia, who relatively poor, who ran the vegetable and fruit stand and uh, had to pay bribes and was treated with disrespect and was slapped and, and apparently spit on. And um, he had enough, he, he went to the gas station after he had gone to the municipalities and the local municipal government officials and they backed up the abuser, he had enough and he, he lit himself on fire. Uh, that wasn't there. Uh, social media's role wasn't included in the literature in a serious way. And also the regional angle in their world doesn't figure very much in the compare doesn't figure in the as far as I know in the comparative politics literature that this regional role that was important in the Middle East. Now I agreed more with um, the transitions literature's approach to democratic consolidation in terms of tax. And um, O'Donnell and Smitter. Uh, define PACs as negotiated compromises or efforts at national consensus to address conflicts that could derail a democratic transition. They talked about a military PAC, extricating the military from politics, how there needs to be national um, uh, discussions and, and cooperation and consensus building to extricate the military from politics. They talked about a political bargain uh, political parties uh, that cover all of the major conflicts in the society uh, coming to a political bargain. Uh, the socioeconomic pact was an issue that they raised uh, uh, largely to make uh, socioeconomic changes because the rebellions were partly about the economy to make socioeconomic changes in an inclusive way to uh, begin to answer the demands of the people who rose up, while at the same time, not just distributing uh, state resources that uh, in the end damaged the economy. Um, so you needed um, some kind of consultation of the main social forces during this transition period. Um, and O'Donnell and Schmitter, they're Latin Americans. They write all about Southern Europe. So they probably had in mind the Spanish uh, transition in which there was a socioeconomic pact uh, to help the democratic transition, including announcing uh, as a country uh, this, that uh, labor, business, capital, the government are together to help consolidate this democratic transition. So they talked about those three pacts. Um, but that wasn't sufficient to capture democratic consolidation challenges in the Arab world during the Arab Spring. Two PACs are important that, um, that O'Donnell and Schmitter did not cover. A nation state PAC. Uh, our countries had national unity issues. Uh, 
once the authoritarian regimes broke down, those national unity issues uh, became very serious uh, and a threat to a democratic transition. Uh, the state level, in contrast, I, I'd imagine to the Latin American states that O'Donnell and Schmitter uh, researched, uh, there are real state issues in the Arab world. And I suspect that uh, Latin America, what, became independent in the 1820s. So the countries that emerged from that have had quite a while at nation building and state building. Our countries haven't had that experience. Uh, and I'll end up arguing one of the strongest propositions from, what, from this work is that it's very difficult to, to consolidate a democracy if you do not have a modern state. And a modern state, on Bavarian lines is defined as a military and security force capable of monopolizing violence within the territory, uh, a rational legal bureaucracy, and um, tax resources to pay for the military and the bureaucracy. Um, attempting to have competitive elections without monopolizing violence uh, has led to violence and, and unfortunately civil war in a few of our, our cases. Um, a second pack that uh, was not a part of O'Donnell and Schmitter's framework that I think is important for the Arab world would be a rule of law pact that entails uh, human rights, respect for human rights, which would mean uh, reform of security sectors and the judiciary from the way they function under autocratic rule. Um, transitional justice, national reconciliation and transitions that are very bloody that occurred after a long period of brutal authoritarian rule Transitional justice will obviously be an important issue. And it's even more so as we've seen uh, Syria in, in Iraq, and I should add Iraq obviously came from US intervention, not a part of the Iraq's transition, not a part of the Arab Spring. Um, but transitional justice and national, reconcili re national reconciliation issues are very important when uh, post-Civil War, how can you just move into consolidating competitive politics without um, dealing with that issue? So uh, socio a socioeconomic pact, I'm not sure if I talked about that one. Um, uh, the emphasis from O'Donnell and Schmitter was about inclusive policy making in order to to uh, help legitimate emerging democratic transition. Um, I expanded on, on their focus um, in a few ways. One, uh, for our region, economic, socially and economically, it was very important to get rid of rent-seeking elites, an economy dominated by rent-seeking elites. Uh, and getting the capitalists of the region to turn away from, from rent extraction and towards production and, and, and uh, competition. Um, you know, the Arab Spring revealed that there was a poor relationship with the World Bank and IMF with, with these Arab countries that would go on to have democratic transitions. Um, the World Bank and the IMF ended up supporting um, cronyism and rent sinking uh, in their efforts to support transitions to a market economy. So in fact, the, the regime leaders would, in their negotiations with the World Bank and IMF, they did not share accurate statistics. And you ended up basically with the World Bank and IMF supporting what had been crony capitalist authoritarian regimes that were reviled by the population. And their contribution to it 
IMF and the World Bank looked like it was the contribution of, of uh, go ahead and privatize the economic resources of the state. So state-owned enterprises and land and it turned out to be upward land reform during the switch from Arab socialism to this crony capitalist type of authoritarian rule that the World Bank and the IMF helped to, uh, to succeed. And um, another thing about the socioeconomic pact, I had to think through um, what kind of economic development strategy might help um, consolidate a democratic um, transition. And um, the at the end of the day, I ended up accepting what all uh, five countries or six countries um, supported as their goal during these transitions. It was about maintaining uh, a market-oriented economy uh, because it's important for these countries to develop economically that they take advantage of the opportunities within the global capitalist system um, and also take advantage of a, a vigorous private sector that's not committed, committed to rent sinking or corruption. Um, that's the goal uh, across the cases in that uh, in, in practice, none of our cases ended up, even after uh, the democratic transitions, ended up with an economic reform strategy um, that uh, uh, that took advantage of a, the private sector and global capitalism. Um, the transitional justice, human rights, I talked about those issues. So if you look at those kinds of issues uh, and you're trying to figure out a way to explain the differences in, in outcomes of the Arab Spring transitions, um, I ended up just to preview it, uh, arguing that Tunisia's unique success based on comparative strength and national unity is based on comparative strength and national unity, state capacities. It had an advantage in terms of an apolitical military. Uh, it had advantages in terms of limited Islamist secularist, secularist polarization, which helped uh, consolidate a political bargain. Uh, and, uh, but it's been, it's, it was weak in terms of, of delivering on socioeconomic improvement. But even with those things, getting the military out of politics, the political bargaining, but bargain between Islamists and secularists, uh, and a political military, uh, those things me uh, meant that Tunisia has to the considerable extent consolidated is democracy. Uh, the military, let me just say one other thing about the extrication of the military from politics. If they are involved in politics in Tunisia, they weren't in Egypt, for example, they were. And the task for uh, Egyptians, one of the major tasks was trying to extricate that powerful military and powerful in the political sense, military sense, and economic sense to extricate them um, from politics and, and convince them to um, accept democratic consolidation, which of course did not end up occurring. Um, and to Egypt wasted really their relative strength and national unity and state capacities because uh, uh, the military was not extricated from politics. Um, there was greater Islamist secularist polarization in Egypt and that played into an opening for the military to move back into power. Um, the Libyan case uh, and the Yemen, Yemeni case, I suppose as well, both suggest that a modern state is essential for democratic consolidation. 
And moreover, attempting to implement competitive uh, elections without a modern state, without, monop without even the monopoly of violence uh, within the country with various types of militias that, uh, that emerged during the battle against uh, Gaddafi, uh, trying to move ahead with competitive elections, uh, failed miserably and, and, and there's been a lot of bloodshed obviously. Uh, similar with Yemen. I also talk about broken states. Iraq, which we broke along with the British, is, is, <laughs> they are our major ally in, in George W. Bush's uh, invasion and occupation uh, of Iraq. And so in those with Iraq and Syria and ISIS, um, I talk about what kind of nation states they were and how uh, attempts at democratic transitions with these characteristics of the state uh, ended up with, ended up um, fostering violence and, and immense human suffering, obviously. So um, in, in these cases, uh, my, my main cases obviously are Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. And what time did I, I start at 12.30? I have 40 minutes, is that the goal? Yes, that would be good, yeah, you're fine. So, okay. Um, so my main cases are the cases that were the most involved in the Arab Spring in the transitions away from authoritarian rule, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, in addition to the broken states I, I just mentioned. And the way I handled the, the case studies was to begin with um, challenges to the regimes prior to the Arab Spring. And in all of our cases, these are authoritarian republics that, I've, that I had characterized in earlier work as crony capitalist versions of authoritarian rule, um, which I define in, as, as uh, having four characteristics, policies that combined with a narrow elite ruling coalition led to um, really the, the, the corrupt distribution of state owned assets and land to uh, a crony small elite, including members of the, uh, of the regime. So Mubarak's family, uh, Bin Ali's family and so forth. Uh, this transition, gradual transition away from Arab socialism that these countries undertook uh, also had a change in political institutions. A facade of multi-party politics developed Legitimacy became more tied to um, pluralism and multi-party politics, but the legitimacy was weak, obviously, uh, because of the, that's evident from the amount of repression necessary to maintain those regimes. So I, in all of those cases, I talk about the challenges to the regime. So in, in Tunisia's case, there were <coughs> Islamists, there were, there were various stripes, there were labor unions uh, that challenged the regime. Um, so um, eventually, the, the, obviously there was an uprising in Tunisia sparked by, ben, by Bouazizi in late 2010. The transition occurred and um, it was left to Tunisian leaders to attempt to consolidate this transition to lead the consolidation of this transition to democracy. And it, with my framework, you have to deal with extricating the military from politics. Luckily, Tunisia's military has been apolitical the whole time. Uh, a political pact, uh, and in this case, the big conflict was between Islamists and secularists. And, and again, uh, the Tunisia, Tunisia was blessed in the sense that Islamists and secularists uh, 
had been working together to plan a post BNLE future for uh, a decade or so before the Arab Spring started. Um, also utilized or the the uh, I can't remember his name the uh, Stepan I guess uh, was it uh, I think it was Stepan Alfred Stepan who used who um, developed the concept of the twin tolerations and the twin tolerations means that uh, in the Islamist secular secularist conflict means that Islamists will accept temporary rule if secularists win power, uh, as long as they play according to democratic rules and, on the, and, and the same for secularists, that they would ex tolerate Islamists taking power if they abide by uh, rules of democracy. Um, so that conflict settled very well for, for Tunisians. They, they, they ended up with a very interesting conclusion working together, the secularists and Islamists in Tunisia. They ended up uh, making a strong case that in the Arab world, you really need Islamist secularist coalition governments in those early elections that determine the constitution and so forth. Uh, it can't just be by part rule by partisan victories in temporary elections. Um, so uh, a political pact uh, in the twin tolerations developed in Tunisia that gave them great advantages. Now, I end up arguing that Tunisia's democratic consolidation is in trouble. And that's because the economy hasn't changed under Ben Ali, it's still corrupt, it's still crony capitalist. There's a push they, after an initial movement away from the, the, the private sector cronies in, in, in Tunisia, uh, a few years in, um, an argument was made by the, the government in power that we need to stop doing that. We need to uh, stop pursuing uh, transitional justice with these capitalists. We should use their their capital, we need it now, so stop this attack on them. But essentially what it ends up, ended up being was um, um, no change in the economy, really. And, and that's, I feel is very dangerous uh, for the Tunisian transition. Also the, the um, rule of law human rights pact has improved slowly. Uh, trend, um, judicial sector reforms and security sector reforms uh, have been slow. Egypt, uh, as many of you know, the, uh, the Mubarak, long-standing Mubarak regime had not been le legitimate in a while. It had faced the challenges, had faced challenges prior to their spring from, from labor unions, from when it's the Kafaya, the Enough movement, uh, Islamists, obviously. But again, uh, we were all, most were shocked by the uprising and the toppling of Mubarak. But once it happened, uh, Egypt had a serious challenge with extricating the military from politics. And, um, you know, in this framework I'm using, uh, the way this has to occur is you need um, to get civilian elected authorities to gain control of uh, uh, several areas to extricate the military from leadership selection and, and, and policy making. I mean, those are the most important uh, and, and a few other uh, points as well. Um, now, the military um, in Egypt did back away from their position in the political economy that has a huge role in the economy with, with military enterprises uh, that are a big chunk, chunk of the economy. Uh, the military didn't shoot when Mubarak pushed for it, uh, and they played the role of supporters of the of the um, revolution. Now we know in comparison to, to Tunisia, the, the military 
uh, first, it wasn't apolitical. And second, it was very reluctant to give up its prerogatives. Um, so um, during the transition, the military in Egypt, the SCAF, the, their, their leadership, made itself the, the, the institution to guide this democratic transition. In Tunisia, the military got out of the way quickly, uh, completely. And um, that was a bad sign. The good sign was that the military backed off and out of the political system for a time, uh, but they were really measured in, in trying to figure out how to protect their interests and perhaps reimpose uh, military rule. And at the end of the day, they did that. So one of the ways I talk about Egypt is to talk about how the military was ambivalent about um, democracy despite posing as supporters of the transition and revolution. The Islamists were ambivalent about it and we see that in uh, how the Muslim Brotherhood was reluctant to share power with uh, secularists. Uh, they, Islamists did so well in those transitional elections, um, uh, but they, unlike the Anahada in Tunisia, they did not sincerely uh, reach out for secular allies. And there are a number of ways that becomes clear. A big one was that after they started winning these elections, they had promised that they would not attempt to control parliament and the executive branch and the constituent assembly, and they would not even have a candidate for the presidency. And they reneged on that. They reneged on, um, there were these odd cho choices for governors um, when Morsi was in power, including making a known terrorist with blood on his hands, the governor of the region where uh, his organization executed uh, mainly foreign uh, tourists. Uh, the, the secularists as well seem more ambivalent about democracy than they did in uh, Tunisia. And partly that was, was probably because the, the uh, Islamists weren't as open to, to an alliance to deal with polarization. But there are uh, a, a few extraordinary incidents, like for example, the parliament, the first, the lower house, the first uh, elected parliament um, the secularists in Egypt ended up siding with the Supreme Court and, and the military uh, in terms of, of dissolving that um, elected body. So there's a, there was ambivalence on both sides. Um, the socioeconomic pact issue, similar to Tunisia, there was some progress in dealing with the corruption on the Mubarak. And then obviously as things turn away from the revolutionary forces, uh, that ended as well. In Yemen, um, I highlighted, well, first of all, our challenges to, to Salah's crony capitalist authoritarian regime included the Houthis, obviously, the Zaidi Shia, a revivalist movement that turned into opposition to the regime and, and the regime's alliance with the Saudis and even socioeconomic issues start to play in it. And we know that there were some say that the Arab Spring conflict was just one more of the Houthi wars. Um, the Southern movement, uh, obviously uh, Yemen was, was uh, two countries. In, prior to what it was the 1990s, the uh, South Yemen and North Yemen. Uh, so that challenge was important. The jihadi Salafis, that challenge was important. Uh, and Salah's rule at the end of the, his time uh, was contested by other elites. Gradually in his rule, he had changed from a sharing of power and economic resources with other elites uh, to doing it less so. Um, Yemen itself, obviously the, the, the transition broke down and um, we are um, having um, uh, a war um, 
currently went through this the civil war. I talked about that. The national, the nation state pact issues. Obviously, they are in a war, so we know, uh, or some, uh, on some, in some phase of an attempt to uh, emerge from the chaos and war. But um, you know, a nation state pact would be different from for for Yemen in that attributes of the modern state are very weak in Yemen. Uh, in its long history, the state in Yemen has not monopolize the use of violence. The state is relying on tribal militias. The tribal militias are armed. Um, and uh, so the, the um, attempt to democratize without monopoly of violence in Yemen uh, with, was very difficult and contributed to uh, the civil war that we have now. Um, also, it should be mentioned that, that, that in both Libya and Yemen, the political parties have associated militias. There are still the tribal militias. There are still the militias that wrote, that that emerged during the conflict. Um, so that violence and a lack of modern state attributes are a tremendous challenge to any full transition and consolidation of democracy in Yemen and also in Libya. Um, I talk about uh, near the end because it became apparent to me that issues of, of state and nation were pivotal in uh, understanding the results of the Arab Spring. So uh, in the states that have broken apart, Iraq, Syria, and ISIS. I talk about their background as nation states. Obviously, Iraq uh, was created uh, by the British for uh, to make up for his for their betrayal with the Sykes Pico Agreement. Um, Syria had national unity and modern state issues going into the Arab Spring, obviously. And I talk about ISIS uh, in the sense of how they built up their version of a state and what has caused it in, its end. You know, obviously the biggest <laughs> cause has been um, armed groups in the region and outside the region uh, have worked to, to get rid of ISIS as a territor territorial entity. So how do I conclude this study? As a summary, I, I uh, conclude that the Arab Spring demonstrated that the vast majority of Arabs yearn for democracy, respect for human rights, and socioeconomic justice. Across the region, millions were killed, injured, or displaced while striving for these goals. Um, this uh, gave me a firm belief that the uh, that the exceptionalism argument, the argument that the Arab world is, it is exceptional in its resistance to democracy and respect for human rights, um, the Arab Spring demonstrated that that is not the case. Um, conclusions. Now, I, look, I return in the end to my own framework and what it might have in the analysis I did and what it might mean for studies of comparative studies of democratic transitions and consolidation. The first conclusion with nation state and barbarian state rights, uh, state pacts, it's clear that uh, the need for a modern state, especially the monopoly for the use of violence within the territory, um, is, is pivotal. Uh, and without it, it's, it's, I don't see a lot of evidence that it's even possible to consolidate a democracy without a state that monopolizes violence, that has a rational legal bureaucracy, uh, and then that can pay for state uh, fields. Uh, national unity is also pivotal, uh, tempting to democratize without it. The national, unit, the national disunity in Libya, in Yemen, and in Iraq uh, 
contributed to those transitions turning into civil wars. Uh, in terms of the nation state pacts, I conclude that obviously this is uh, radical Islamists um, gain power in failed states and um, attempting to uh, transition to democracy without a modern state uh, ends up fostering failed states in these cases. The military pact uh, literature talks about extricating the military from politics, but it doesn't talk about a military that dominates the economy as it does in, in uh, Egypt, to an extent in, in on the Salah in, in Libya that um, these militaries are going to fight harder to, to maintain their power. I mean, the Egyptian military cordons off up to 40% of the economy uh, from state policy. Second point is the need for sustained mobilization to uh, continue the momentum to extricate the military from politics, that that momentum stopped in Egypt when Islamists and secularists uh, ended up in conflict and the uh, military in Egypt took ready advantage of it. So uh, sustained mobilization as elected leaders attempt to extricate the military from politics seems to be important. Uh, in terms of political pacts, uh, one conclusion is that yes, um, coalitions and between Islamists and secularists and the twin tolerations can help consolidate a democracy. But in the Tunisian case, uh, they've moved to the next step in that secularists and Islamists post Arab Spring have had coalition governments, but that has limited policy choices for the people. Both the Anahda and, and the various uh, secularist coalitions in in Tunisia um, uh, the, have um, ended up pushing for the same policies, greater security and following the World Bank and IMF on their market reform model. And as I said, the economy isn't changing and hasn't changed in these 20 years. And both the Islamists and secularists are, provide, are presenting that platform to the to Tunisians. And at this point, it would help their consolidation if, if, if these political parties went back to their corners and developed their own policies, including a possible alternative to the, the modified market reform strategy that is recreating crony capitalism. This in terms of socioeconomic, socioeconomic pacts, it's, it's uh, unfortunate that the Arab Spring did not provide, did not end up with, um, did not end up changing the economies in any, um, crucial way. Um, there was an opportunity during an authoritarian breakdown to change the trajectory and it did not happen. And the World Bank and IMF are very explicit about that, even in the Tunisian case, how that, that, that was a missed opportunity and that we're returning to crony capitalism, not socioeconomic justice. Now the rule of law, transitional justice and national reconciliation, those issues, obviously judicial and security sector reforms would be necessary because those the judiciary and the security sector had functioned as ways to protect narrow uh, patronage networks of the, uh, of the elite, of the small elite. So reforming the judiciary and security sector to protect all citizens is seriously important and it's been difficult in Tunisia and obviously Egypt backtracked. Um, secondly, in this, in terms of those issues, transitional justice and national reconciliation 
uh, are very important in um, Libya in transitional justice uh, was combated by a political isolation law, which ended up being a way to discredit elected officials that were secularists and um, the Islamist parties and their associated militias used that political isolation law to get rid of uh, electoral competitors and to take over uh, an assembly that, uh, that should have been largely led by secularists. Iraq's debathification also set up a terrible dilemma in terms of transitional justice and national reconciliation. Debathification was too broad. Uh, it got rid of the, the people, the military, um, uh, the military, uh, the, the military members that were largely Sunni. Um, and it didn't replace it with the national military. So instead, you ended up with the state attempting to uh, consolidate a democracy, but without the monopoly of violence in the country. Okay, that's my opening uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions and to learn from you all as well. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was uh, very interesting and focused. I have a couple of questions which I'll ask at the end because I want to give the floor to, uh, to our uh, you know, kind of attendees. Sure. And there were a couple of questions that, uh, in, in terms of regarding Syria. One of them is whether you think that the regional and international, the lack uh, of the regional and inter, uh, national intervention had precipitated an Arab winter in Syria, or, or the other question, which is whether, uh, whether the fact that they did not intervene uh, caused uh, the Arab Spring. So have you included the international uh, kind of uh, why? Yeah, um, um, I have. It's not the major focus. At some point, I mean, it became as the uh, transitions slowed and continued over time, outside actors really got involved in trying to influence uh, these transitions. We know, um, obviously, uh, uh, Egypt has gotten involved in Libya, Qatar has gotten involved everywhere. Uh, the Iranians in, 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 in Yemen, the Saudis in Yemen, the UAE, all of that, obviously, it's, it's important. I didn't make it a central focus, frankly, because I figured um, that uh, division of labor, someone else would step in, and I think they have, uh, with these international influences and uh, uh, foreign policy. And uh, I've always preferred the domestic angle to, to foreign foreign policy, but in the Syrian case, um, you know, the, the uh, when the Free Syrian Army, the, the Free Syrian, I think that was the organization's name, um, they rose up and, and, um, and the, the ethno-sectarian conflict uh, was not there at the beginning. They rose up uh, for the entire population and um, they needed support internationally. Uh, I, I think, to, uh, I think uh, Obama probably regrets not establishing a no-fly zone in some part of Syria that would have allowed the Free Syrian Army uh, a chance to maintain a coalition and combat uh, the Assad regime. Uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think it was a failure in that sense. Okay. Uh, thank you. And there's another question regarding uh, what sorts of new mechanisms the regimes employ to sustain uh, authoritarian stabilities in the post-Arab uprising era. Did you, you know, kind of, uh, uh, are there new mechanisms that they are employing to try and sustain uh, authoritarianism? Um, well, they, they all emphasize, look at if you want to try to get democracy, you end up in hell, as in Libya, in, in Yemen, uh, in Syria. Uh, so uh, authoritarian stability 
it has been one of the arguments in those cases. And I was even interested, interesting in the in the Libyan case that was there a couple there was another comment I meant to mention for for Libya. Um, um, yeah, so so fear of 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 chaos and violence, I think it's been the the biggest argument uh, that's intuitive and they, they've used it successfully. Um, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I in the opening of, of this book, I, I write it for the next Arab Spring. And uh, so once it's consumed, uh, what happened, I think there were, and obviously movements are starting again, Algeria and Sudan are, are starting to rise up. I don't think that it's forever. I think there was a cost to these authoritarian regimes for, uh, uh, for the Arab Spring. And um, they aren't as stable as they might've been, even if they reproduced the, the pre-Arab Spring authoritarian regimes. Um, what else have they used? Uh, well, those are the main points, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question, which is, yeah, it's, it's a kind of, um, perhaps a comment. Can we speak about Arab Spring or a Christian winter, uh, which I wasn't sure of what it meant, but I don't know, it's a matter of naming. Uh, Arab Spring, uh, Christ, uh, is that, um, is that about the US and Trump? I don't know, I presume. <laughs> so that might be I, the that's, that's funny. I, I certainly feel like the US is in an Arab winter. It's, yeah, exactly. It, it's, an, it's appalling and uh, it's, it's so racially based. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, this is, this is about even just this week, these last few weeks, where they've been trying to repress uh, political participate, the Republican and Trump repress the political participation of, of African Americans, which really hits a nerve. I mean, this has exactly been our experience, even post slavery, that uh, you know Reconstruction and then the the KKK emerges in in. Um, so it's it's horrific, and it's horrific that nationalists. Uh, national supremacy has taken hold and that's what the Repu half our political participants are in my view uh, supremacists because you white supremacists because you can't support the Republican Party and ignore the uh, the racism and so and in fact whatever your justification for voting for someone like that you you're the outcome is going to be um, you know, repression of black people and racism, and, you know, continuing a horrific legacy. So for me, sure. I mean, this is a national, a, a national winter or whatever. There have been moments, and I know we're, this is a sideline subject. There have been times when I think that uh, I'll just move to Ghana. I mean, go somewhere. It's been a very frustrating experience that it almost feels like white Americans will never uh, will never forego white supremacy in general. Obviously, they are like we know the percentage that 43% of, of white Americans uh, disagree with Trump, 57%, according to the election, agree with him, which is a disturbing and disappointing outcome. It is, it is. Um, there's a question from Bayan, but I think we have answered your question about international support. Um, and there's another question, in post-conflict settings, international communities always ignore transitional justice, ignoring justice at the cost of securitization. And uh, we always fail both transition and security. So when you talked about the monopoly of violence by the state, uh, does that not- uh, Say what? Not, uh, when I said what? Um, does monopoly of violence by state that- oh. was, Yeah, is that possible? Uh, if you have the monopoly of violence by the state uh, mm -hmm. without transitional justice, mm -hmm. is it possible to have it, uh, it, you know, kind of a secure situation toward democracy? I end up on the fence a little bit on 
on transitional justice, rule of law, and national reconciliation. I, I do think our region demonstrates that, that, that uh, those issues can derail democracy, uh, especially mm -hmm. because of the violence in the history of, of repression, and autocrat, brutal autocratic rule. And then, I mean, uh, what good would the elections be in Libya and Syria in Yemen after all of this, if you don't deal with, with, uh, you know, with uh, transitional justice and human rights and what happened in the past and what you're going to do about it? It, 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 uh, you know, it almost feels like it's trivial to to talk about competitive elections if you don't address that at all. Exactly. Uh, we have we have a question here, which is. Um, about Algeria, how important was the Algerian president of 9192 in paving the way for the establishment of a secular Islamist paradigm leading to the restoration of authoritarian rule during the Arab winter and the failure of democratic consolidation? And two... Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one? I only caught half of it, I think. Okay, so uh, how important was the Algerian president of 9192 in paving the way for the establishment of a secular Islamist paradigm, which has led to the restoration of authoritarian rule uh, during the Arab winter and the failure of democratic consolidation. What does he, he or she mean by uh, a secular Islamist paradigm in, in Algeria? Uh, I'm not sure. Umberto, can you ask the question again, um, please? But the second part of the question is democratic consolidation in Tunisia seems to have been successful, but the economic transition is still lagging behind. Considering external shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing polarization between secular and Islamist or post-Islamist forces, is there a risk of a return to the authoritarian rule? I think you did talk yeah. about that. I mean, I, uh, I, think, I think the economy, uh, is a great risk for the Tunisian uh, transition. Mm. It's the same economy. It's the Ben Ali economy, dominated by uh, corrupt uh, uh, crony capitalists and 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 um, you know, uh, the same. Uh, they're returning to the same economic policies that were crony capitalists without making a change. It really must feel to most of the Tunisians that it's the same Ben Ali economy. And that's just not acceptable uh, or sustainable, uh, or at least it's, it's it's a challenge to their consolidation. So in Tunisia, what I ended up saying is that they could, they've uh, made considerable consolidation of their democracy. They've made very important steps mm -hmm. with uh, dealing with Islamist seculars, polarization, um, the political bargain. Um, They've had three changeovers in power from Islamists to secularists and back. That's a very strong sign of democratic consolidation. Okay. Uh, there's a question about the main reason for the entrenchment of authoritarianism in Egypt. What do you think? Well, I think the failure of extricating the military from politics. And as I said, the, the way to do that, you have to maintain. Um, mobilization against the regime. When the opposition was unified, Islamist secularists, everybody wanted to get away from Mubarak uh, and they were out in the streets and in and, and millions. The military wasn't willing to shoot people. It was willing to allow this transition, though they tried to control it from the top. Uh, they, I mean, Morsi won and took power. They didn't stop him before he took power. So the military was pulling back, uh, but you need sustained mass mobilization to continue that. And, and, and once that stopped, as well as the split between Islamists and secularists, with secularists starting to side with the military and the Supreme Court, uh, the military was in, uh, in a position to move in, betray the secularists that they said they would you know, that they were intervening to end Morsi's tyranny and uh, and he, they really just CC reestablished the old military authoritarian regimes in some ways even stronger, more 
a bigger grip on the economy. Uh, anyway, there are free areas where, where Sisi has, has uh, become even more authoritarian than Mubarak was. Mm. Um, and uh, there's a question from Rami, with the resurgence of uprisings last year from Iraq to Lebanon to Algeria and so on, how can the Arab world break free from the endless up and down cycle? Well, I think it's good news that we have uprisings, but anyway. Yes, that they're coming again. And uh, in, in, in a way that I really thought um, uh, Algeria, which didn't rise up during the Arab Spring, has had a serious popular uprising that the Algerian military that's still trying to, to, to control, and they don't have control over that. So uh, yes, that's exciting. Uh, also in Algeria, when I think about Algeria, and they, uh, the, the masses have risen up to fight for democracy. Uh, They're gonna have the challenge that the Egyptians had, a military that dominates politics and the economy. So they're gonna fight harder uh, to stay in control. Um, that's one of the sad lessons of the Arab Spring is the consolidation challenges are so difficult that even if you get the uprising, even if you get authoritarian breakdown, mm. consolidating that democracy is tough and it varies. As I said, Tunisia didn't have to get rid of a powerful military, uh, mm. but Algerians will. Um, and I end up, what I end up um, trying to do in the book is to talk about ways to deal with that. Uh, and as I said, uh, popular mobilization that, that lasts, supporting elites that get elected that are trying to extricate the military from politics. Maybe they want to change a constitution that limits the military's role. The public has to get behind these leaders to during the transition to uh, try to push the military out of politics. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, which is, uh, can the speak, uh, so can't see how speaker can say Bahrain, uh, sorry, while I agree with much said, can't see how speaker can say Bahrain nearly fell. There was never any attempt to call for regime to be replaced, only joined Shia and Sunni call for reforms in Bahrain. Whether the regime might have granted marginal reforms was surely never relevant to Saudi Arabia. Um, would not Egypt have had a better chance had elections not been rushed? Uh, in Egypt or in, 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 in which country are you talking about? In Egypt? Well, I think the question is, is a, a question about Bahrain. Uh, mm -hmm. There was never an attempt to call for them to be replaced. Yeah. Only join Shia and Sunni call for reforms. And then uh, whether regime might have granted marginal reforms was surely never relevant as Saudi Arabia would never have uh, counter countenance reforms in a state next door. And then the next question in this question by this uh, by this attendee is, would not um, Egypt have been had a better chance had elections not been rushed but been delayed to allow non brotherhood parties time to organize? Yeah, I, I agree with that second point. Um, strongly, uh, you know, it was uh, after they uh, uh, got rid of Mubarak and uh, the transition was starting, the first step, the military that I said took over the transition process instead of what happened in Tunisia, that this, they stayed out of the way. Uh, but uh, I, one of the first steps was that the military decided was to uh, amend the, the Mubarak constitution and um, have elections quickly, which the Muslim Brotherhood uh, agree with as well. Uh, and secularists had good reason to want to slow it down. Uh, they needed time to develop organizationally uh, to, to, to compete when the Muslim Brotherhood could just take off from what it's been doing uh, prior to their spring. And they had a tremendous advantage. So. Um, you know, I, I agree with the, the secularists of, of Egypt who push to delay uh, these elections and give themselves a chance to, to grow as an opposition. Eventually, uh, they got organized as the National Salvation Front. I mean, a, a year or two after, uh, a year or so after 
when he was only in power for a year. But sometime in, in Mubarak's time, um, they started to organize. So yes, I agree with that. Um, and, and I suppose the Muslim Brotherhood uh, took advantage of the situation. And, and I guess I would think of it in terms of the twin tolerations uh, to prevent the split between Islamists and secularists. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood probably sh should have uh, tried to uh, accommodate secularists on the issue of, of time during the transition. Okay, uh, thank you. To what extent did religion have an influence on the Arab Spring, example in Syria? Do you, and how has authoritarianism impacted the Syrian situation or crisis? So two related questions in terms of religion in Syria and also authoritarianism uh, role in, in, the, in the continuing crisis in Syria. Um religion uh, in Syria. I mean, um, no, I mean, the uprising uh, wasn't um, led by uh, Islamists. They were, and that's across the region, by the way. That's another interesting thing about the Arab Spring, that all of these rebellions, they, they were basically young secularists who rose up, uh, and then Islamists once, after a bit of time, stepped in and joined them. Uh, so certainly, uh, in general, the the uh, having the the Islamists join these modern these secularists uh, was promising. Uh, and then I look at it in terms of religion, in terms of the twin tolerations that, uh, you know, are secularists willing to accept um, Islamists running and getting power based on elections as long as they accept democratic rules in the constitution? And uh, do secularists accept uh, Islamists getting to run? Uh, or do Islamists get, uh, get uh, tolerate and accept secularists getting to run as long as they play about democratic rules? Uh, the other piece of, on, on religion is that uh, within this polarization of Islamists and secularists, the Islamists played a role in trying to moderate more radical, the moderate Islamists played a role in, in trying to, especially in, in the Tunisian case, if you look through it, they played a role in trying to moderate uh, uh, more radical Salafis to accept this democratic transition. Uh, so that ends up being an important role. And it's the same in, in, on the secular side, I suppose. Um, Another thing about religion in general in the Arab Spring, as we recall, you know, the, at the early in the Arab Spring, the radical Islamists were on their heels. Uh, Islamists in Tunisia and Egypt, in this new era of democracy, this emerging democracy, they could get power by running in elections, both social and political power and economic power by running in elections. So. Radical Islamists were on their heels, and 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 and, um, but unfortunately, the the difficulty in consolidating democracy, uh, the failed states that emerged because the states with limited state capacities uh, didn't uh, survive the the transition in electoral politics. So. Um, I suppose that's 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 unfortunate. They were, you know, radical Islamists like ISIS and Al Qaeda were on their heels, and then the transition experience allowed them to reassert themselves, including obviously ISIS and so forth. Okay, so I have I have a question, which is in relation to uh, in relation to your kind of framework that or, or the. Opening, opening things around democracy and explaining uh, 
uh, democratic elections as being a, a one factor in trying in trying to say okay this is a democracy so whether you have you know so the idea the focus on elections as but that that reinforces as far as i'm concerned the exceptionalist argument about the Middle East because it's a and and again it kind of frames the discussion in a Western centric um, frame of what democracy is. So um, in a, and and the, a related question is in terms of your approach and you said that we need to have modern states. How do we define modern states? What are the characteristics of yeah. a modern state and yeah. how do we move towards that? I, 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 I'm sorry, I missed the first question, but I got the second, let me answer that. You know, I define uh, modern states on barbarian lines. One is the military monopolizes the use of violence within the territory. So the state controls the territory. There aren't militias out there with guns or anything like that. Um, those militias were uh, in Libya and in, in Yemen and, uh, the military uh, did not monopolize the use of violence. Um, so I think that's the most important piece of a modern state, that the military monopolizes the use of violence. Modern states are also defined by um, uh, a rational legal bureaucracy, according to Baber. So I use that instead of a patrimonial bureaucracy and so forth, how the administration um, uh, is able to function and, and, and the government is able to operate in a way that uh, people who vote can feel like uh, their policy choices can be implemented. Uh, let me read on that point. It was something I meant to read at the beginning by Ali Zaydan, who was the first elected prime minister in, in, in Libya's transition. Where did I put that? Um, uh, Ali Zaydan. This is what he said after he fled Libya. Um, Libya has lived through 42 years of systematic destruction. The government has no army or security forces to control the Libyan street. Armed Islam. Islamic groups are spreading radical new ideas and the country's administration is weak and small. Those are all conditions that aren't modern states. That's the opposite of it. And trying to have competitive elections and consolidate those, it's, it's extremely difficult under those conditions. And those are the Libyan conditions. They weren't the Tunisian conditions. One was more, much more close to a modern state going into it. So and uh, so if we go back and think about uh, the kind of, uh, again, um, and if you think about the, the barbarian argument in terms of legal authority and authority and charisma and so on, how would you bring in the idea of leadership and charismatic leadership as being central to a modern state as well? Um, I actually haven't thought about that issue. Um, I mean, Weber, um, uh, right, uh, charismatic leadership, uh, but he talks about, uh, as I recall, there's, there's an evolution of that in Weber mm -hmm. that's separate from the way he characterizes a modern state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and by the way, the, that definition of the, the modern estate I gave, it's the most common definition of a modern state in the comparative literature. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, so there's a, a related question to this from Abud, uh, saying that in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, states has absolute monopoly over the violence. Can we call them modern states? Say that again. They have absolute monopoly over violence. In uh -huh. Oh, I see, I see. But does that mean it's a modern state? I mean, that's one attribute of it. Gaddafi had 
had monopoly of the violence in this state before it was mm -hmm. the revolution. Uh, um, so that's just having the monopoly of violence does not make a modern state. Um, I w in this transition, though, what ha one has to be careful about in transitions is that uh, once the autocratic regime has broken down and Gaddafi's monopoly of violence is over, it has to be reestablished. It has to be reestablished. In the West, uh, I mean, I, I in a arguing or thinking that once Gaddafi was killed, the Libyans had invited the West, the UN, to help protect their transition. Once Gaddafi was gone, I think the, the these international forces needed to stay there long enough to take the guns out of everybody's hands. And we probably should be under UN auspices. But that, because Libyans were open to it, they reached out, that was the moment when um, uh, the international uh, actors, I think, should have and could have could have um, stopped a, a whole lot of misery in Libya, mm. taking the guns out of the hands of, of, of these various militias. Okay, thank you. And I think the last question, uh, is there a chance of, of democracy in Sudan? Mm. Uh, Sudan was the other example. Sorry, I, I, Algeria, I, at the end of the book, I talk about looking ahead and that Sudan and, and Algeria are, are both having mass uprisings for democracy. In the Algerian case, they will have to deal with that powerful military. Uh, there will be challenges in the Sudanese case on national unity, I suspect, and some other issues. So the same kinds of challenges that my framework discusses in the beginning will be challenges for those uh, uprisings for democracy as well. Final, final question from me, which is, uh, we've got like two minutes. Um, you talked uh, around social media. Do these models and paradigms and concepts, do they take account of social media? They uh, do they take account? You know, I break down democratic transitions into authoritarian breakdown. If we break down these autocratic regimes, transitions to democracy, means, meaning elections that are free and fair and the opposition wins and takes power. And then all of these challenges of democratic consolidation that I spoke about uh, uh, today. Um, I can actually say yeah, for some reason, the, um, say that question again, I'm sorry, I lost my thought. Is there, is there a, you know, do you take into account in these, in these kind of um, very much, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry, social media. And, and um, social media was crucial in the Tunisian and Egyptian case. It was, uh, in the Tunisian case was interesting in that, uh, you know, Ben Ali didn't realize how dangerous social media was and he encouraged it during his time in power. But social media allowed Tunisians to get around Ben Ali's police state. Ben Ali had, um, uh, the strategy under Bin Ali was that if there are conflicts, you shut down information. And the conflicts generally occurred in the southern part of Tunisia, in the interior, where the poorer people were, and resources are in the capital. So conflicts would arise. He shut down the media in these conflicts in the south, and he went on. Now, social media in Tunisia got around that. Once conflicts in the south started to occur, social media um, help spread information, help organize people, help people get into the streets. And uh, that was great. Now, uh, certainly regimes have become more savvy these days about social media. So I, I, I think they were caught off guard uh, during the Arab Spring, the potency and, and mobilizational ability of social spring, of, of, of social media. They were caught off guards and, and, and now they are more aware of it. So uh, it's, it's not going to be as positive for democracy and human rights as before as these regimes get better at, autocratic regimes get better at using social media to maintain their control. Okay, thank you very much. We're coming to the end. Uh, Nargis, do you want to come in? No? Only to say thank you.
really, no, I just, I was trying to think, you know, fitting, sort of going further east, fitting Iran or whatever in the argument, but I suppose they're, you know, different category, but no, only to say thank you very much. And many of the uh, people who questioned have also expressed their thanks for a wonderful talk, very, you know, um, thought provoking and um, rethinking the idea of modern state. Well, I thank you guys for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, to uh, rethink about these arguments. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to reading your book and hearing it next week. Um, and um, have, a, have a good day. Or okay. Okay. You as well. Okay. And have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.